Hello, this is Kamavis from MetaMask, and I'm going to be talking about Lava Mode. Uh, Lava Mode is a set of security tools uh, for any JavaScript app to mitigate software supply chain risks. And it's really a general tool, uh, but it's especially important for those working with digital assets, whether you're working with private keys directly uh, by implementing a wallet or building a, a DAP or something like this. Um, so my major case study here is the event stream incident. Uh, so this made quite a splash at the time, a bunch of news articles written about it. Um, what happened was a publisher of this package called event stream uh, added a maintainer that maintainer published a targeted attack against the copay wallet uh, by the BitPay team, and a compromised version of the wallet was was published for a few versions before the compromise was found. Uh, so Jackson Palmer of Dogecoin uh, really summarized it here. BitPay essentially trusted all the upstream developers to never inject malicious code into their wallet. Um, but this isn't particularly a major shortcoming of BitPay, this is kind of the way that we write JavaScript apps today. Uh, so how can we fix this? Uh, you know, so around the time of the incident, there was a lot of discussion, especially on Twitter, about how to do, how to resolve this. Uh, you know, there's one camp that says never use dependencies. And uh, I really don't like this one because, uh, you know, sort of the, the great vision of technology is how the technology builds on technology, standing on the shoulders of giants and this sort of thing. Um, and, and what about when you want to use cryptography that's not available uh, as like a browser API or something like that? Uh, you know, you're not supposed to roll your own crypto, so um, that, that seems like a non-starter to me. Uh, and then the other side was like, always audit all your dependencies, always all the time. And obviously that's a good idea, but it may not be practical in all situations. Uh, dependencies change and update, like, like the event stream uh, case, the attack wasn't there from the beginning, it was a very legitimate module from the beginning. At some point it was added, that targeted attack was added. And so you can also find yourself in a situation where um, you maybe you have in production a potential loss causing bug and you need to fix it and that requires some dependency updates and um, you may not be able to audit all of them in time or how do you prioritize that two things so um is there is while well, auditing is still important uh, what what else can we do how can we mitigate the risk is there is there nothing else here um so mark miller uh you know, chief scientist at Agoric, he's been working on language security for the past 30 years. He's been working on JavaScript and trying to mutate it into a more secure language over the past 10 years. Um, and he has this great quote, just don't add security, remove insecurity. And so maybe uh, said in another way that's a little more obtuse is, is like, start with nothing and then only add what you need instead of giving everything uh, you know, the full feature set from the get-go, because uh, features in the hand of an attacker is, you know, an, an attack vector. Um, so at Agoric, he's working on CES, uh, also known as Secure ECMAScript, and it's a sort of secure runtime for running third-party code safely. Here, runtime is a little confusing. It, it's just running inside of normal JS. It's not like a meta JS in JS interpreter or WebAssembly or something like that. It's just a, a, a context in which JavaScript is run, and you, this works in the browser and node, and I'll show a little bit what that's like. Uh, but it does, CES does two main things, and one is frozen intrinsics. Intrinsics, also called primordials or built-ins, we're talking about like array and object and these basic things that are built in. Um, they're actually mutable in, in JavaScript, so you can change what like array.map does. Um, and that can break some expectations in, in terms of like what has access to some things. You might think you have something like safe in a closure, but then um, if the fundamental like array prototype map is mutated, then something could get access to to an object that you wouldn't expect to have access. So that can sort of break your expectations. Um, and so the uh, you know the oversimplification of how they fix that is just freeze the array prototype, and that doesn't let anything modify what array, what it means to be an array, and what an array does. Um, uh, the other thing it does is explicit endowments. Here, endowments means what is exposed to an eval function. Um, and so 
here you have kind of like a normal eval thing. You pass in a code string, and now you have this additional argument called endowments. And um, that is where you control what it, the eval function or what the code that gets evaluated has access to. Because normally, when you, when you run code, it has access to anything like the platform APIs, like network access, you know, fetch, uh, storage access, local storage, or some other storage APIs. Um, so more in the context of what we're looking for is when we're executing a module, we want to control what that module has access to, such as network access or metadata about its environment. Uh, and the way that they do this, again, an oversimplification, is that when you do that uh, SAS evaluation internally, it is evaluating code inside a with block. And that with block, the target of that with block here listed as endowments, um, is where they can control whether or not uh, access is uh, allowed for whatever reference they're trying to do. So if you're trying to grab fetch, but fetch has not been whitelisted, um, they can throw an error here using the with keyword. That, that's just SES internals, but I thought that was really neat because I didn't think this, this sort of thing was possible. OK, so now on to Lava Mode. Lava Mode is an attempt to sort of reduce the harm, the potential harm that dependencies uh, can, can bring to an app if, if they become corrupted. Um, so you get that basic sanity for intrinsics, the, the object and array and these sort of things uh, are immutable. Um, you get to control the platform API access, again, storage, network access, uh, per package. Uh, for example, if you have a string formatter, it doesn't need, you probably doesn't need network access. Um, and then we need the modules inside of your app to not be able to uh, corrupt each other. So LavaMo provides these protections. So how would this have uh, prevented the event stream incident, the, the uh, copay wallet hack? Uh, so to, under, to answer that question, we need to understand how an app is built. Uh, in general, you have three phases. You have the dependency install phase, then you have your, your build script, and that produces a blob, um, you know, the, your, your app, and then that is published and goes to your users. And in the case of a wallet, where the users are have their private keys on their own system, um, this is where the attack actually happened in the case of the Copay wallet. Um, it's at runtime in the user's uh, and user's own machine. So obviously that's where the attack happened because that's where the private keys are. But the attack actually started inside the build phase. Event stream was a developer de dependency of their build system. Um, and the attack happened there. It, uh, it actually used its file system access to modify the contents on disk of a UI dependency. And that eventually got bundled into the app. And that's how the attack got in. Uh, but it could also happen at the install phase uh, because uh, in dependencies have post-install scripts and pre-install scripts and that sort of thing. So uh, they get uh, control of the system there as well. So you really need to lock down all of these phases in order to, to have the security guarantees about what you're shipping. Uh, right. So the first one, uh, taking care of that dependency install phase, uh, you can use yarn install ignore scripts uh, or there's a similar flag in npm. Um, if you if some of your things need actually need scripts to like prepare some um, local some some native dependencies or something like that, you can whitelist them and run them individually and that's what I encourage you to do. Uh, next thing is uh, build. You need to run uh, just just like at runtime, where your dependencies have a lot of ambient authority if you're not running in, in a containment system like LavaMote. Um, your build system can reach all around the system, uh, corrupt other modules, use file system access, do all these things you didn't expect. Um, so you need something like LavaMote for Node, which is still in development. And then at runtime, uh, a appropriate LavaMote plug plugin for your bundler. So if you're using Webpack or Browserify or something like that, we have a lava mode plugin for that bundler and then you add that and that will make sure at runtime the your dependencies are correctly constrained um, so right now uh, we've got an MVP for lava mode browserify 
uh, Lava Moat Webpack is coming along. The internals of Webpack are a little more complicated. And uh, for every major bundler, we can make a, a plugin for it. The, the specifics are, uh, are not that different from one to another. So uh, in addition to that, uh, Lava Moat also provides a tooling to help you prepare your configuration. Your configuration is what platform APIs uh, packages are allowed to have. Um, and so because you can have a lot of packages, we uh, provide some automatic config generation tools and some uh, visualization of what, what your current configuration looks like. So the configuration generated is a uh, JSON. So here we've just got a little slice of it. We have this one package called stream HTTP. It's trying to use these globals and this is the auto generated output. So it's, it's allowing those globals to be read. Um, and then it's also allows that package to pull in from other packages or pull in only these other packages. Uh, so Here's a little embed of our visualization tool. This is part of MetaMask's dependency graph. Um, what we're looking at here is all these nodes are packages in our dependency graph. And uh, the purple one here is the, uh, is the entry point. And then that pulls in a lot of different packages there. And those then have subsequent dependencies, and that sort of thing. And if you notice, it's kind of a bit of a rat's nest. There's a, a lot of interlinking between modules. This is actually good. That means there's a dependency graph is working as intended. There's a lot of code de deduplication because a lot of modules um, have uh, dependencies in common with each other. Uh, the next thing you'll notice is the colors. The colors here are um, a attempt to highlight which of the packages may be particularly dangerous to your situation based on what kind of privileged platform API access they have. So if we grab one at random here, um, let's see, go down. So here's one called TweetNackle. Uh, it's a crypto library and it's using the crypto uh, platform API under globals, you see crypto true there. Uh, the crypto API, it may not be dangerous because it's it's just providing some utility functions for doing cryptography, uh, but it also has some APIs for key storage and this sort of thing. So if you're using those in an app, this could be potentially dangerous. Um, and then you'll see a lot of you know, you know yellow ones uh, here. It is uh, less maybe less dangerous here, it's using set timeout and clear interval, but it's, it's good to be aware of those things um, because uh, specifically set timeout and clear interval, these sorts of things can be used for timing attacks. Um, also, you see lots of green ones. The green ones, curiously, don't use any globals. They're just interacting with other packages and providing a like higher level subset of uh, functionality of their dependencies. So uh, the ETH SIG util doesn't need any platform APIs, but it uses uh, some cryptography libraries. It uses some encoding libraries to provide you a, a higher level of abstraction. Um, so again, this is a tool to just give you an idea of your configuration and uh, what, uh, what the risk profile is. Uh, it also helps you prioritizing auditing of your dependencies because you can start with the red ones. Um, Another way to look at this data might be to look at it in like a, a, a list format and you know sorted by dangerousness, uh, and that's useful too. But it's also important to view it as a graph to understand the connections between dependencies, uh, because, for example, uh, one of these things that that has a uh, you know has a potentially dangerous platform API access like this one, it's just a, a wrapper around network access here, and then it's providing it to this one, which is otherwise green but um, it's basically getting a wrapped version of that network access. So you, you also need to audit around the uh, particularly dangerous ones. But yes, this can help you audit your dependencies. And I would like to highlight that the dangerousness here is only guaranteed at runtime run if you're using lava mode, because uh, this package, you know, does not have direct network access. And so that's a nice guarantee to have, but we only guarantee that it doesn't have network access if it's running inside of lava mode. Um, if you, it could be doing something tricky that we did not discover in static analysis to actually get 
uh, network access. Um, now that wouldn't work in Lava Moat because that's never provided, but outside of Lava Moat, it could pull that off. And then your dependency graph looks like this. And you know, good luck prioritizing your audit there. Um, so in summary, now in 2019, towards the end of 2019, Lava Mode is alpha. If you're using it, you're rather cutting edge. Uh, but by next year, uh, if you're not using it or something similar to contain your dependencies, you are negligent to your users. Uh, thanks. So that's that's Lava Mode. Um, it, that QR code is for a little Google form to, to help gather some information about what bundlers you're using, what's your use case. Uh, please let us know more, and then we can prioritize development to helping your case. Thanks.